Hello and welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm excited about the message today. And we are going to be talking about discerning the times. So I have a question for you. Have you ever wondered where is everyone's discernment? You know, where is the discernment in the body of Christ? You know, I woke up this morning to an article, another major ministry that basically is closing down its doors and behind the scenes were some things that are that were in the category of immorality and dishonesty, those kinds of things. And so, you know, the question is, we should be discerning as believers. And I want to talk about that because every one of us have the ability to be discerning. And uh, we may get into a little bit, you know, there's nine gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. One of those is the discerning of spirits. But because you and I are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body, we have the ability. There is things that our spirit knows right now that our head, our intellect, our understanding may not know. And we're going to talk about that, but I'm going to take us over to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. And I want to encourage you, be sure to download the devotional free and take some notes on this. Uh, You know, whether you have a journal or a note-taking system in your Bible, whatever it is you have, make sure to take notes. I'm telling you, it's a biblical principle. Habakkuk like 2 and verse 2, it says, write the vision and make it plain. So in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, it says, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all Uh, goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Now, this is going to seem so simple. Uh, I say it this way often. Some things in the Scripture, many things in the Scripture are so simple, we need help misunderstanding them. But the problem is we've had a lot of help misunderstanding them, and I believe there's a whole move of God right now where he's raising up a whole new front line of of ministers, of believers, of fivefold ministry gifts that are walking in truth and light. And if you'll notice what it says here, we are light. Jesus said, you and I are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. He says here, walk as children of light. And therein lies the problem right there. We've had frontline ministers that have not been walking as children of light. And I'm not going to get into it, but there's been so many headlines lately of things that are difficult to wrap your mind around by good men, godly men, uh, leaders in the body of Christ, and doing things. And we're backing up going, how could you do that? Uh, That's not light. That is not truth. And as the word says here, notice, walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, right standing with God, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. This is what you and I have to focus on. In order to be discerning of the times that we live in, we need to walk in a manner that's acceptable to the Lord. It's almost as though... We've seen a bent on ministry where it's like people push the envelope of what they can get away with and still be a Christian, or they're walking in a manner that's just right on the edge. You know, uh, (laughs) made me think of something. I live up here in Colorado Springs, and uh, there's an old mining town up here called Cripple Creek. Now, unfortunately, the place is legalized gambling, so the town once again is focused on that, but we had gone up there. There's an old gold mine you can tour. Uh, it's called the Molly Kathleen gold mine. I've, I've actually taken our, some of our staff up there, our campus pastors years ago, and we went down and it's fascinating. And here's a, an old town that there was that gold rush in Colorado. Well, when you get up in those mountains, there are some very steep, um, uh, you know, ravines and things like that. Well, some of them don't have guardrails on them. And uh, it was kind of funny because my wife and I were driving up 
and I'm being very careful. I'm staying on the pavement, and it's almost like my wife thinks there's a break on the dashboard of our car. <laughs> she's she's like, you're too close to the edge, honey. And so you pull over. You don't want to get in the other lane. So, And it's almost like I've thought about that. That's the way some believers live. How close can I get to the edge and still be okay with the Lord? And we have got to have a different mindset. We need to go and find out what is acceptable to the Lord. All of this wokeness and compromise that's coming out of pulpits today, we're seeing a rise of the apostate church. And what is that? Well, Paul warned Timothy about it. He said there's going to be a whole group of people that they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power that could transform a life. And so what is that? Because when I read that, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, Timothy, know this, in the last days, perilous times would come, dangerous times, stressful times. And and we're in those times right now. We're living in dangerous times. That's why it's so important that we secure our walk with the Lord by walking in the light because we are children of the light. But I remember when it really, the light came on that scripture for me, and all of these things that Paul described, men would be lovers of themselves, fierce, without self-control, savage, and <clears throat> unholy, unthankful, disrespectful to parents, and it's all this stuff. And I used to think, well, that's talking about all of the unsaved people down the street, or all of the ungodly people down the street, or all of the atheists, when Paul said, no, these folks are going to be in a church, and it, they'll have a form of godliness. So think about this. When you drive down the street and you see a church, something says church, or it's a particular denomination, or it has a steeple, or a cross, anymore, that doesn't mean anything, because the people behind that and their lifestyles and who they are. Do they have a relationship with the Lord? Or have they done what the Apostle Paul said? They would be guilty of lasciviousness, which is basically unbridled lust. And they would doing it, they'd be doing it in the name of the Lord, like, oh, the grace of God covers this. The blood of Jesus covers this. This is why Jesus died on the cross. Well, the Bible says, awake to righteousness and sin no more. And here we find it where it says, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding what is acceptable to the Lord. So now here's a key right here, fruit. I remember when Lester Summerall was alive, we were actually driving down the road in my little Honda Accord. I just picked him up from the airport. And at that time in the body of Christ, there was this kind of wave going across that everybody was using titles in front of their names, apostle so-and-so, prophet so-and-so, and all of these different kind of things. And I'll never forget this. Dr. Sumrall, he looked out the window and he said, you know, a banana tree doesn't need a sign on it. And I've thought about that where we're at today. When somebody has to tell you constantly, God told me, God told me, God showed me, is there anything wrong with uh, saying that? No. But when you hear it and it's exaggerated to the point, it's almost as though sometimes people are trying to convince themselves that God told them that, or they're trying to convince you that God told them something or God spoke something to them. And the bottom line of it is we are to be fruit inspectors. And so one of the things, and this is, this is what we're talking about in this series, discerning the times, discerning, seeing what's really behind the facade, what's behind the veil. There's a phrase, not all that glitters is gold. There's a thing called fool's gold. And up here in Colorado, you know, we've, we've had that before because they call it fool's gold because it glitters, it looks like gold, but it's not actually gold. And so they, they have testing to, to see if something is gold. It's what we call the acid test. And it's a kind of a chemical. And if it's true, then it will turn out a certain way. 
and you can you can find out if it's in fact gold or fool's gold. If there's ever been a time that we need that in the body of Christ, I've seen people that get swept up as a pastor for all these years now. I've seen people run after this little fad or run after that fad or run after this going on or that going on and be led astray. And church, we don't have to do that. We need to be discerning of the times that we're living in, and we also need to be discerning of the people that we're associated with or that we're around. And so let's go on in this Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. It says in Ephesians 5, 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And Here's the scripture that we need to understand. There's a day where people are just, well, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to, I don't want to cause any difficulty. I don't want to speak up about this or that. And that's not what the word tells us to do. It says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That's the first thing, but rather expose them. Now, that doesn't mean you're you're suddenly deputized by the Lord to be the policeman in the body of Christ. But as you walk as a child of light and you let your light so shine before men, you will expose those things. You know, you need to let your light shine. It won't shine automatically. Uh, remember when we were little children, some of you may, that we used to sing a song, this little gospel light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. And we would sing that in Sunday school. I was growing up in the Lutheran church and they said, put it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. As, as childish as that may sound, we need that today. We need to have our light shining in the darkness. Salt, and we're also the salt of the earth, is a preservant. And so, when you pull the salt out of something, that's the way they used to preserve food. When they pull the salt out, then what happens is corruption and deterioration sets in. And so if you look in America right now, look at our school system in the mountain of education. You know, we, we're, we're fired up mad at the left, the liberals, so to speak, and the LGBT community and all these different kinds of things. The only reason that perversion has come into our school systems and our educational system is compromised and that history is not being taught that's accurate, and I could keep going down the list, the only reason is because the light ceased to shine and the salt was not there anymore. And so while we blame certain individuals, we have to go look in a mirror and realize that we, the body of Christ at large, have allowed that to happen. It goes on, and it says in verse 12, it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret, verse 13. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Now, here's the key right now in our series that we're in this week, uh, in during this lesson, is discerning the times. You need to be discerning of the times. He says, therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, this is where you're going to want to take some notes and uh, make sure you download our free devotional on that. And, and start some note-taking on this. So the word circumspectly, that's an interesting word, but what it means is it's also defined as diligently, accurately, and it's from a word that means in a most exact and strict way. That is so important that we get a hold of this. So Paul says, make sure that you walk circumspectly, be diligent. I'm going to say it this way. The blessings belong to the diligent, not to the slothful. It goes on, and that word, as we pointed out, is from a word that means walk in a most exact and strict way, most 
precise and be rigorous in your commitment to the truth. That's important that you do that. There's, there's no blessing that's going to come out of being slothful or lazy. Lack of diligence is going to cost us all. The diligent are going to eat the good of the land. Hearken to the voice of the Lord. Be diligent in all you do. And I'm telling you, the blessings are there for those that are going to be diligent. And so if we continue to read in verse 16 of Ephesians chapter 5, it says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Well, I think most of us recognize there are days right now it's just difficult to wrap your mind around. You know, when you you open up and you look at the headlines, the hideous, heinous murders and acts of violence, things that are being perpetrated on our children. You send your children to school. When I was growing up, schools used to be one of the safest places in the country. So when I grew up in the public school system, school was not only safe, it was a place where good things happen. We had scripture reading every day, and I'm talking a large public school. Uh, and this was not, now I was in Texas. I grew up in West Texas, so we think of the Bible Belt down there. Um, recently, um, I pulled out a copy of what was called the Dallas, Texas New Testament Survey. David Barton's ministry, Wall Builders, had that reprinted. And so I got a copy of it. I think it was a 1940 something reprint. So I actually text David Barton. And I asked him, I said, David, when did we stop using this uh, New Testament survey? Now, get this. When I was talking about the fact that school used to be wholesome and safe. So in West Texas, where I was, we read scripture every day, large public school, prayed every day, and pledged allegiance to the flag. And so uh, most of the schools would start out, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee and beg thy blessing upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our nation. And, and it was at that point, 1962, 63, Madeline Murray O'Hare kind of spearheaded a, uh, a move to get prayer removed out of school. And so right about 1963, that was successful. And in a country that was 97% predisposed to believe in God, the Christian God, and what happened from then on, we can see President John F. Kennedy, who was a threat to darkness back in that day. Here he was a Democrat, and he's even conservative in comparison to many of the people that we see in office today that call themselves conservative. And so there was an assassination. And if you look at our statistics, everything began to go downhill from there, from SAT scores, grades, safety in school. So just the acknowledgement of God in our public schools was enough by those precious children across our nation. There was an acknowledgement of God, and it was holding back the forces of hell, and statistics can prove it. It's not just my opinion or some other preacher's opinion or something like that. <clears throat> it's statistical. David Barton wrote a book entitled To Pray or Not to Pray, and he had a whole team of researchers <clears throat> go and gather, and it was a, quite a laborious work, and it's phenomenal. This book was published in the 90s, and from 1963 on was a demarcation, and it was like safety in our school and education, grades, everything about it fell off the map, literally plummeted. And so what happened was, we didn't realize when you go back to the genesis of our country, because of the scripture and the fact that the Bible, we were teaching reading so children could read the Bible and we used the Bible to teach reading, we realized that was a wisdom of God because the entrance of his word brings light. And every time there's light, you'll find there is life. Think about a plant. If you put it in a dark closet, that plant's going to die. 
If you put a plant in a closet and a little bit of light breaks in, that plant's gonna start going toward the light. So what we've done is not only our school systems and our public educational venues and things like that, we've taken the light out, we've made it illegal to mention God, we've talked about this foolish thing called separation of church and state was a total misunderstanding and completely flipped from what our founders intended. And then all of a sudden, when you remove God out, you remove light, you remove life, and you remove life. And what has happened in our country? The darkness has crept in, death has crept in, and perversion and all these other things. So because of that, discernment has gone out the window. People are just not discerning anymore. And so we're talking about discerning the times that we live in and the importance of being able to do that. Now, so let's go one more here in verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Verse 17, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, I need you to pay real close attention. Stay with me to the end of this broadcast. I want to pray with you. There's a couple of things you have to be, um, you need to understand here. You and I need to understand the will of God. L let me say it this way. I want to ask yourself right now, concerning God's perfect plan for your life, concerning the will of God, on a scale of one to 10, where do you think you fall in there? Do you have any idea what the will of the Lord is for your life? Are you still in a place where it's like, Lord, what do I do with my life? What, what direction should I go? What direction? Well, the scripture says here, if we don't understand the will of the Lord, that we're walking as unwise people. That would be like foolish. And remember, if you go back up in verse 14, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give us light. So this is important, and this is what I want to equip you with in this particular teaching, and that's that you can be discerning. You can discern the times that you're living in. You can discern the environment that you're in. You can discern the will of the Lord for your life. God wants to know, wants you to know what his will is for your life. You know, I've had people, I, I've lost count how many times people say, I just don't know what the will of God is for my life. I don't know what the Lord wants me to do. And there's two things I want to point out on that. You need to understand there's general the general will of God and the specific will of God. So there are some things, and let's just call it the road of life, the general will of God. God gave us this thing called the Bible as an instruction manual for us to walk in, and it's called the way of the Lord. This is the mind of the Lord right here. And so there's some things you don't need to pray about. And you go back in the Old Testament, and God gave his instruction to Moses. It was called the Ten Commandments. And it's, it's basically the law of God. And King David said it this way, Oh, how I love your law, O Lord. And I've watched people be deceived by the enemy and recoil if you say the phrase, the law of the Lord. And they're like, I'm not under the law anymore. I'm under grace. And I, I get what they're trying to say, but you have to be real careful. You're misunderstanding, I think, some things because when I look at the body of Christ and the general will of God and understanding of the way of the Lord and what you and I should be walking in, let me give you an example. For instance, you don't ever have to pray about whether or not you should steal something, okay? You don't have to pray about whether you should commit adultery or not. You don't have to pray as to whether you should dishonor your mom or your dad, even if they're not godly. Uh, it says, honor the Lord. Uh, I'm sorry, honor your mother and your father so it will be well with you. So all of those 10 commandments, you don't have to pray about, should I go after false gods or anything? And some of you are saying, that's a ridiculous thing. Of course we know that. Well, not everybody knows that. 
And there are churches that don't know that. There are preachers and people that call themselves pastors that don't know that. They have gone the way of the world. So there's the general will of God, and that's why this Bible is so important for us that we get it written on the tables of our hearts. But then there's a specific will of God. For instance, you can't open your Bible and say, you know, if you're praying, should I move to Colorado Springs? Um, Should I take this job? Should I take that job? Should I quit from here? Should I go to Bible school? Should I do this? You can't look there. So that's the specific will of God. And the most important will of God is the general will of God, the word of the Lord, the law of the Lord, the instruction of the Lord. And what the Bible says is, in thy light we see light. And we're going to get into that more in the next session. We're out of time, and I want to pray for you right now. I do believe the Lord has spoken to some hearts today. And Father, I pray that the light of your word has come forth. And I pray for the listening audience right now, that Lord, you will strengthen them in their inner man, flood their hearts with light, give them and grant them a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the Lord in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And remember, there is a telephone number on the screen for further prayer, but let me close with this quote from Peter Daniels, who I've had the privilege of meeting, and he's ministered here at Church for All Nations twice over the years. He said, success presupposes the willingness to bear pain. And this is a message that's got to be restored back to the body of Christ, the doctrine of self-sacrifice and suffering. I'm going to leave you with that one today. Success presupposes the willingness to bear pain. What does that mean? Denying yourself, denying your flesh, so you can follow after the things of the Lord. Thanks so much for joining me in this time of teaching, and I'll see you on the next session. Before you go, I want to read a few verses out of Hebrews 10, starting in verse 23. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep His promise. And let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. What powerful verses that we are meant to look for ways to motivate and encourage one another and that we're not to neglect assembling together. I want to encourage you, if you're not already a part of a Bible-believing local church in your area, that you would do that, that you would take those steps to become a part of a community of believers. And if you're ever in the Colorado Springs area, we would love to host you at Church for All Nations.